Good morning, good morning, good morning. Perfectly normal morning this morning. A lovely morning this morning. Those with the very sharp oral skills will notice that I'm a bit croaky. I've had a really, really shocking, uh, shocking cold this week. I had Tuesday and Wednesday off. I was so bad. This thing is a sprayer. Those two uh, plates on the back. There's a there's a there's a big tank with a fan at the back, and it sprays out both sides of that big plate thing. It sprays left onto one row of trees and right onto the other row of trees. And uh, they were very nice. When we moved into the area 20 years ago, they said, "Would we like them to?" let us know when they're spraying in the like, fields around the cottage so that um, we can uh, hole up and shut all the windows and doors and stuff like that and we were like oh that's you know I mean basically if someone's spraying in the field next to you you sort of know about it you know so we said no we're not bothered we love the spray it's a healthy spray you know we uh, you go out, actually go into the garden, breathe in great lungs of it. Oh, I've got water in my ear. Oh, that's annoying when that happens, isn't it? So, how are you? How are you? You're still alive, you're still around, you're still well. Oh. I uh, went and had a chat with a neighbour the other day. And uh, he's got some bad news. He's got pancreatic cancer, they think. Because you can never tell with the health service these days. He might be diabetes, I don't know. But anyway, that's what they think it is. And so, having not spoken to him for about a year, we had quite a full and frank discussion about end of life issues, such as what's the best way to give away stuff. And also, I sort of cheered him up a bit by introducing him to Zoopla, the website that allows you to look up how much your house is worth. And he's like, he thinks his house is worth, uh, he thought probably 340, 350, possibly 400. And I was able to tell him it was worth 888. So <laughs> he's like, how do you know that? And I said, well, these, these like, crow, Corvid. There's these um, nice poppies as well, weren't there? The, the, there's this website you can look this sort of thing up on these days you know this is new thing called the internet oh well, that was great 888 he's a wealthy bloke but sad story obviously it's never you know nice to hear anything like that is it he's um he's not really making me live any longer by dying because he's not in my um, age bracket you know so he wouldn't have been included in the by uh, life expectancy statistics when uh, when I was born. So it's undeniably 100% sad. Anyway, his wife died. She had a stroke and uh, was in a wheelchair for the last few years of her life. Uh, but he's a lovely old boy, ex-motorcycle racer, had a motorcycle accident and basically lost three inches off his leg, his right leg. So for his entire life he's walked around with a trainers where one trainer has got a three inch higher sole on it, you know, like a boot. And that's where he met his wife, he was in hospital for so long. And his wife was the nurse, the straight matron, and so the two of them had a relationship in the uh, <laughs> in the hospital bed by the sound of it, and uh, ended up getting married and had two children. So when he dies, then that you know that property is going to get sold. So, but he's still fair and healthy at the moment, but. Uh, 
you know what cancer's like, you know, as soon as you've got a definitive diagnosis, and uh, especially if it's spread stage four, then you can bank on about three months or so. And then uh, that's it then, it, you know, the major impact on family dynamics. Uh, it's a bit of a morbid subject on such a nice day, but I mean, uh, for a start, you can't expect people to behave properly, you know. Uh, the worst thing you can do is you can say to your gardener and your cleaner, you know, after I've gone, if there's anything in the garage that you want, you know, come and help yourself. Because what will happen is that the day of your funeral, the cleaner, or the day before, the cleaner will turn up with a removal van and she'll, she'll just take the whole contents of the garage. And then when the gardener turns up, uh, there'll be nothing left but a few cardboard boxes. So you get to, you don't actually get to know the worst of human behavior when you die, but other people do. There's an awful lot of um, competition to see if there's anything anybody can gain anything, either financially or just by anything, you know, by anything that they covet that you had uh, in the country. It's like things like shotguns, tractors, and all the things that you've uh, built up. Hello, look, there's someone dedicated running. Look at that. If only I could be like that person instead of just driving along here for a fat old middle-aged dentist. Might be a bit healthier as well. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, and people come round and they'll honestly they'll they'll pull your gold teeth out. Uh, to um, they see it as a period of dislocation, a period in which they could then, instead of the slow grind up in terms of wealth, they can they can go up the escalator in a day or two. So. My advice, I mean it's based on the, the death of both of my parents, is to give away your stuff, you know, as soon as you've got a diagnosis of cancer in a way, I always used to think, you're lucky to know that you've got cancer because you could just die of a heart attack. That's the worst thing, isn't it? Or in a road traffic accident or something. No chance to update you will. No chance to tell anyone where the password to the safe is. No chance to uh, say goodbyes. No chance to uh, put your affairs in order. Say goodbye to everybody. Give your um, give your stuff away. Get to see the look on the faces of the people who can't believe their luck when you say, "Yeah, you can have my car or whatever. I won't be needing it in three months." So uh, you know, close down your bank accounts. Transfer your money. Pretty well, do your own probate, you could, in three months, couldn't you? Put your house on the market. Close down all the accounts in which you're the only signatory, or take yourself off. Perhaps go on a little holiday with your grandchildren. Note your future self. I hope you're watching this, because this is good advice, mate. No, the people who, uh, where there's chaos, and there is chaos for a brief period. A lot of the time when people die, um, you have to blame the people themselves. I can hear it when I breathe. I'm bubbling, my lungs are bubbling away. It's not pleasant. I shouldn't be going to work. I've got a few people to see and uh, some guys didn't bother having any treatment I recommended and then has rung up and said he's got a big party on Saturday and can I his front tooth's falling out and can I fix it for him so I'm going to be doing that in my lunch hour which you know my wife was pretty fed up about I said to her this is you know private dentistry is either private or it's not We've got a long and proud tradition of doing crap NHS standard dentistry in this country and calling it private. 
so that we can charge private fees. But there are very few dentists that do private, private dentistry. And uh, having your dentist available to fix something that's of critical importance at short notice is, I think, one of the benefits. So, if there's a big fat cut there, and I've teleported forward several miles, it's because I nearly died having a coffee thing. However, I do believe the emergency has passed. Do you know those discoveries? I don't think of like flying shoe boxes. I really don't like them. Anyway, we had solar panels fitted to the, the building where the surge was located yesterday. So they're rather pleased because they've been connected a little bit sooner than expected. And we're about to have the sunniest day of the year. It's going to be 30 degrees in Portsmouth, 29 degrees in Portsmouth today. And we're not far away. And you can see from the shadows behind the cars that the sun's already beating down. So I reckon they're going to be very happy when they get their little app going on their phone and find out how many kilojoules they've got in the bag. Also, while we're on the subject of death, my advice to you would be, although it's going to seem like a massive pain, and your wife is going to be probably very, very disinclined to agree with you, if someone's terminal, then I would think very seriously about just moving them in for the three months or so that they're going to, it's going to take, rather than putting them into a uh, residential hospice or whatever. Because one of the, the big regrets, you know, this is what I was saying to my um, neighbour, um, you know, it's your, your, your memories don't really, people still remember you after you die, and people still got photographs of you after you die. Um, but what they really don't have after you die is um, the ability to talk to you and ask you questions and things like that, you know. So, for example, they'll inherit all the old family photos. And then, but then they'll look through them and they'll say, well, that's, that's mum or that's dad or that's my granddad. But who, who's that standing either side with him at that wedding? Was he, did he have brothers? Was that, was, was that his brother's wedding or... You know, who's that holding the baby or whatever? And I know it's a pain, but, you know, you, your oral history, your oral history is the thing that dies, really. Um, everything you know is the biggest loss, I would say. You know, I mean, apart from, obviously, the financial support and the emotional support and everything that, uh, that you get when, when someone one of your parents dies and stuff like that, but, you know, I think by the time your parents die, certainly in my case, I was financially secure anyway. And, you know, I was never really going to get left a fortune by my parents and, not, and certainly didn't rely on it. Um, and emotionally, I mean, I had a wife, I had children, and, and uh, so I had, you know, my own little unit in terms of, well, I was feeling fed up, you know, things to do that, my, my mental health was secure. Oh, let's make sure we're good here first. So, um, you know, but what I do miss is, uh, is just, try, I mean, first of all, the ability to say to my mother, look, look what I've done, you know, you know how, look how well I've done, you know, don't I make you proud? And the other thing is, um, uh, just to say to mum, look, you know, what do you think of this? You know, what would you do? Now, I know to a certain extent, you can always say, well, I pretty much know what she'd say. Because, because <laughs> bless her socks, she always used to say the same thing. She's like, whatever you think, <laughs> you know, I trust your judgment on this. Whatever you think, I'm sure you'll make the right decision. I'll support you. Whatever decision you make, I'll, I'll support you, you know, and... I don't understand it, but I'm sure you're, you know, what you're saying is, is right. 
Um, so, although we did used to have some intellectual, sort of fairly rigorous intellectual debates, but but for the most part, she was just supportive. And I know she would still be supportive. You know, she still can, she continue to be supportive. Um, but just that little ability to bring her up and say, "Mum, you know, oh, what, what's it? Uh, you know, Auntie Millie's." Uh, did she lived in Ricelip? Now, what happened to her? So, um, what I've suggested is that um, what he does is he gets himself a little mini uh, sound recorder and just starts. Because when you go up there, he's one of these boats you can't sort of get away really from him because it, he'll, he'll start telling you about how he um, knows the bloke who uh, set up the local go kart track. Uh, 50 years ago and then who died and then he bumped into that bloke's widow at a, a charity ball or something all stuff which is well let me put it this way it's important to him because it's his life and possibly it's important to his children because I mean if I if I had a set of tapes of my grandfather or great grandfather talking about his life um that would be of interest to me. And certainly I think to his, you know, in the future, if he was to make a series of tapes, I think it would be of interest, but mainly to his family, but really makes absolutely no difference at all to me. And he's one of these people that is um, a little bit, uh, how can I put it? He's a bit tone deaf to the fact that what he's talking about is not really of, going to be of any practical interest or use to the person he's telling it to. And so, as a result, he um, he doesn't stop. You know, as soon as he starts uh, stops one story, he'll, he'll then start another one. And you think, oh, well, perhaps this one's going to be a bit more... Is it going to be relevant or something, you know? Is it, or is it going to be funny or something? And, and it isn't. It's just another story about how he's, he sold a truck to someone who then came later and, and, and bought another ten trucks. So... <clears throat> um, but I, I think... Uh, my grandchildren gave me this book called, uh, you know, sort of Tell Us Everything Granddad or whatever it is. And basically it's it's a book which has got a ton of blank pages, which is a nice book to write, isn't it? I'd like to write a book like that. And, uh, but it's got a load of questions, and the questions are all about uh, where were you born? You know, where did you grow up? What was your mother like? Etc, etc. So, so the, the most useful thing about this book is you know, apart from the, the uh, ability to record the answers with, with a quill on papyrus, which is a little bit out of date these days, um, it's, it just gives you all the prompts, you know. So what you could do is you could go to page to page and say, and just tick them off and say, well, Anna, where did you grow up? What's, what was your first school I had? Did you have a pet? I said, was get yourself a, like a recorder and then... <clears throat> What's this fan doing? Here he goes. Here he goes. Yeah, so what I would do, I would do, and I encourage people to do this anyway, and, and that is just to get a little hand recorder. They're very good quality these days. I mean, massive quality. And just sit down and um, put it on a stand and then just go through this, a book, something like this, and and just talk. And you don't have to talk. I mean, talking is easy. I mean, look at me, look at me. Talking is easy. You can just talk to nobody. And just say, yeah, 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 well, I remember then and we had a dog and it always used to jump over the wall, you know, and my, my sister loved it more than me. This is the stuff that dies when you die. The oral history. So, uh, that's about it, really. So then, um, you know, I gave him a lot to think about, you know, mainly the increase in value of his house. So... <coughs> But he probably bought it for about twenty grand. So. But um, so he'll be pleased, and most more of his his two uh, his children will be pleased because they'll be getting a decent chunk. And it's not it's not really said all that often, but um, the pain of losing a pair a parent is somewhat offset, somewhat offset by the fact that you come into a decent chunk of change. Um, 
which in my mother's case wasn't much. I mean, it was only about sort of 20 grand each per, per child. But what we did was, for the first time in our life, we all went on holiday together. We all went to Disneyland together. All, the, all four children and families. So, um, all in all, you know, I mean, and that's what I remember about my mother's death. Uh, you know, not as, uh, the rest of it as well, because obviously I had to, as the eldest son, I had to deal with it all. But, but that Disney holiday was a memorable, very memorable holiday, you know, and a complete one-off, and something that would never have happened if she hadn't injected that amount of cash into the family finances by a very selflessly smoking her entire life and then getting uh, lung, spine and brain cancer. That's what I can talk about now. But for a long time I couldn't. Anyway, it's been very personal, isn't it? Perhaps, um, I don't know, perhaps later on I'll give you a tour of the lab to make up. I'm going to cut out so much coffee now then. And uh, by the time I've edited this, with tears streaming down my cheeks, um, I might have to pad it out with a bit with a with a lab tour. But oh, wait, wait till you see my lab. Oh, wait, my mother would be so proud of my lab. She'd, I'd have given her a tour already. Actually, no, I'd have given her a tour about now. It's just about finished. But you want to see the. You want to see the effort and planning and investment that's gone into this lab. Talking of which, I'm going to need to think about possibly setting up another company for the lab side of things. And um, and then uh, billing, billing the surgery for the lab. For the lab services. Because now I'm doing my own lab work, I've got no... Uh, I've got no... Um, no lab bills. Well, not on the denture side, anyway. So, I'll have a chat with my accountant. They're completely useless, but... When you turn the corner, you'll see the... Um, see the scaffolding there? That's our new... Can you see the building humming? Can you see the lights are slightly brighter than normal? They won't have to um, draw any power from the grid, will they, today? Look at the sunshine. Free money. Free money from the sun. Well, I don't know. You can never tell. With these people, they might be, uh, you know, a massive mistake. But anyway, they're happy about it. Power to the people. That's their slogan. That was Wolfie's slogan, wasn't it? For an extra point, if you can tell me what, what TV series that was. Power to the people by Wolfie. Alright, bye.